Dr. Gayard, what are the impediments that get in the way of considering children for epilepsy surgery? So there are many factors that, uh, that affect a child's getting to, to surgery. Uh, the very basic ones are children being uh, identified as having epilepsy, uh, of people being identified as being candidates for epilepsy surgery. Uh, there are social factors that impede getting children to epilepsy surgery that have to do with medical insurance uh, and access to specialty care. Some people do not refer people, children to epilepsy surgery or they don't follow through an epilepsy surgery because they are concerned that there will be significant cognitive or behavioral deficits as a consequence of surgery. And one of the intriguing things about operating in pediatric populations is they seem not to experience the post-operative deficits that you see in adults. So in an adult, you may accept a small decline in verbal or perceptual memory. You would never accept a large decline in those arenas. But in children, you don't see those declines. Hmm. Uh, and even in children uh, who undergo hemispherectomies, uh, the epilepsy is so devastating and so severe that the consequences of seizure freedom and reduction of medications more than makes up for the lost tissue. And that lost tissue really is non-functional. Uh, and surprisingly, it's very difficult to find significant declines in IQ and gross measures even after so radical uh, an operation as a hemispherectomy, uh, except in rare disorders where children are, are older. But for the younger population, that seems to be the case. Uh, and then the other is is that there are children who are cancer epilepsy surgery, uh, and the feeling is the focus hasn't been identified, there isn't a structural abnormality, and advances in quality imaging uh, may allow people to identify those abnormalities, which then mm -hmm. turn that child from being a poor candidate for epilepsy surgery into an excellent candidate for epilepsy surgery. Uh, mm -hmm. And that makes a big difference in how you weigh options of risk and benefits uh, mm -hmm. with families. So along those lines, are there changes then in how we would evaluate or the patients that you consider good epilepsy surgery candidates today compared to uh, 10 years ago? So there are two different levels for that. One is that with the advent of uh, three Tesla MRI scanners and presumably seven Tesla scanners coming in the future, uh, abnormalities can be found, subtle abnormalities can be found on MRI that were not identifiable uh, 10 years ago. Also, a knowledge of developmental neuroanatomy allows people to image children at the, at the most opportune time, uh, to recognize that an MRI which is normal in someone who's 12 months old may in fact not be uh, normal when you image them when they're 24 months. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, those, th that the issue is in being uh, very uh, careful uh, and, and following through on your evaluation. The other is our children we would not have considered for epilepsy surgery uh, 10 years ago because we felt that they were that they were poor candidates. Uh, and these things include operating on children who have what appear to be generalized EEG patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, while many children's generalized EEG patterns are not candidates for surgery, it turns out that in, in early uh, childhood, uh, the propagation patterns are such that those generalized EEG patterns really are manifestations of focal disease. Mm -hmm. And if you can find the, a focal disease or a focal abnormality, then those children become very good candidates for epilepsy surgery, uh, and that really has only been recognized in the last eight years. Uh, there are other groups of children that have not been considered for epilepsy surgery, for example, children with tuberous sclerosis uh, with widespread bilateral multifocal disease. And there's a subset of children who clearly have their seizures uh, of one seizure type coming from one area of the brain and one tuber, and those children do very well with epilepsy surgery. And even the children with tuberous sclerosis with epileptic encephalopathy, uh, often you can identify with current imaging techniques using advanced PET technology or MEG mm -hmm. or advanced diffusion tensor imaging. You can identify the tuber, which is the primary driving force for that child's epilepsy at that time, and you can operate on that, and you can alleviate the child's seizures. The child is at risk for developing epilepsy from some of the other tubers that one arises, uh, but children with TS can have, you can operate on both sides of the brain as long as it's not the homotopic areas mm -hmm. uh, and be successful in alleviating epilepsy. So 10 years ago, it, no one would have operated on both sides of a child's brain, uh, and now we realize you can do that in, in certain circumstances. Uh, and the other group that had not really been good candidates for surgery are the children with subcortical uh, causes for their seizures, for example, hypothalamic hematoma, uh, and now uh, there are non-invasive techniques which can disconnect the uh, the hematoma from the hypothalamus uh, and often alleviate uh, refractory seizures, especially before the encephalopathy sets in. 
uh, I think what has also happened is people have realized that for some children with infantile epilepsy, where there are where there are horrible developmental delays and what are called epileptic encephalopathies, uh, that if you operate on those children early, there's the general sense, although not proven, uh, that you can alleviate the encephalopathy and improve the developmental trajectory uh, of that child. Mm -hmm. At what point should the clinician caring for a child, maybe who just presented with epilepsy, begin to think about epilepsy surgery if that child is not responding well to medications? So I, I think that any child who, in whom two medications have failed the child uh, needs to be considered a candidate, candidate for epilepsy surgery, uh, almost regardless of the other clinical situation. I mean, well, there are children with devastating other neurologic diseases, mm -hmm. uh, trisomy 13 or trisomy 18, where surgery may not be an option, may be palliative. But many children who even have, with have significant developmental or intellectual disabilities may be candidates for surgery if the seizures significantly impact their quality of life. Mm -hmm. But as a general rule, uh, especially in pediatrics, people are very reticent to operate on a brain which appears otherwise intact. Uh, but those seizures, the, the epilepsy has an untoward consequence on long-term development and socialization, uh, and the opportunity to alleviate children from, from epilepsy early on in life probably normalizes that as much as possible. So I think any child in whom two medications have not worked uh, should be at least considered or someone should ask the question, is this person a candidate for epilepsy surgery? And that question needs to be revisited uh, periodically. The, uh, the other issue in, in children is that in adult epilepsy, one seizure a month is considered to be too many seizures. Mm -hmm. uh, in pediatrics, where children often have many seizures a day, uh, people feel uh, very uh, successful when they've reduced the seizures to one seizure a month, but one seizure a month is still associated with significant morbidity and mortality, mm -hmm. uh, and surgery remains an option for that. As a general rule, if two medications used appropriately in therapeutic doses have failed a child, then the likelihood of the third medication helping is less than 10%. If you have a clear structural abnormality as a target for the epilepsy, the likelihood of seizure freedom is on the order of 50 to 75 percent. Uh, and again, without the consequences of, uh, of, of cognitive behavioral uh, ill effects, consequences from the surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, so those, those are the balances and there are some benefits. And I think that, that families at least need to hear that they have those options whether or not they choose to pursue them uh, is a separate issue. Mm -hmm. But I think the earlier you can have that discussion, uh, the better off the child will be in the long run. Thank you very much, Dr. Gay. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.